Rush and Mike Norwich. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, no, wait. No, it's on my. Hello, hello, one, two, one, two. Yep. And now it's... Can you hear me there? In the Yes, I think I can, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> hello, hello. So, hi everyone. Can you hear me well there? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Good. Are you coming or are you leaving? <laughs> okay. Um, so, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good morning, evening, or afternoon to the people that are joining us online. Um, we are going to talk today about the in this session about the Android implementation stories. Okay. And just to remind you, um, this chart that was shared uh, during the conference uh, on Monday, the first day, this is the adoption of uh, Android, right? This is the number of devices that are using Android during the last 30 days. Okay, so we have already almost 100,000. Okay, so um, it is a big success, I believe, for the for uh, for UIO and for the whole community, but we want to keep improving. So if we go to see this country by country, we can see this that we have uh, Nigeria, Mozambique, Togo, Lesotho, Malawi, okay? And uh, it's been used in, in most of the countries of Africa, in many countries of uh, Southeast Asia. We are starting in Latin America as well. Um, of course, we as the Android team, we can like uh, taking care of the roadmap, we can take care of the features that we are developing for the, for the, for the application, for the mobile applica application. But of course, the most important piece is always the implementations, the deployments, uh, and all that, right? So how the, um, the users are using the Android application, the implementers, how they are the, uh, deploying, deploying the Android application in the field. So um, it's something that we really, really want to hear from you. And I hope with this session, uh, the community 
uh, we learn about the different very interesting use cases, right? So we have uh, four groups here, and we're going to start with uh, Jerry from his West Central Africa, please, Jerry. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. I think now I'm, I'm left with seven minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, is it okay? Like this. Um, okay. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Togo experience. So here in the picture, you can see our prime minister getting the vaccine. So, I mean, we have uh, an article just down there um, talking about Togo uh, initiating the vaccination campaign. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the context, the deployment approach, the main successes, the challenge and the lesson learned, okay? So yes, uh, COVID appeared on the 17th of November, 2019. And I mean, in Togo, we actually had um, our first cases in March, 2020, and March, April, 2020. And we had like 37,000 cases up to now with 273 deaths, okay? So there was a need actually to make sure that we don't have a high peak of cases and deaths. So we actually wanted to start the immunization. So uh, one thing you need to understand is that um, for COVID surveillance, they use another system to actually uh, track the cases, but it actually failed. So for COVID uh, vaccination, they wanted to use another system, but the ministry was like, we've been using DHIS2 for a while and it's been working. So why can't we use DHI2 for vaccination? And then uh, we actually were able to uh, use DHI2 for vaccination. And this was actually the process, sorry. Yeah. So this was a process. So you needed to uh, be enrolled into a website, a platform, whereby uh, when you enroll, then you can go to a health facility and then they will look for your ID. I mean, you need to go, with, you needed to go with your ID because an SMS will be sent to you and then you'll be registered. I mean, not registered, but uh, you, they will actually take um, information about the first dose, the second dose and the third dose, et cetera, et cetera. So we had this kind of process whereby the data was actually uh, sent via another platform to DHIS2. The data, uh, the health professionals were supposed to actually enter the data into DHIS2, and then this data was actually sent to analytics uh, for processing. So, yeah, what we were able to do was, first of all, to configure the package with uh, the Ministry of uh, Health, and then we actually were able to um, train them on data entry. Okay, we train the ones that are supposed to enter the data on data entry. There was a pilot phase in the capital city to see how it will go and it went well. So we finally wanted to roll it out. Of course, they had a lot of support. One, because we had a lot of DHI2 users in the, in the country that could actually support, support from the Ministry of, of Health, support from us. What we did was of course, we actually downloaded the application on Play Store and in some places you had like um, um, phones provided to them, but others actually used their own device. So it was a hybrid system. But what you also, we also did was to have like a WhatsApp group and a, how do you call it, a Telegram group in order to uh, make sure that people were kind of um, assisted or supported when needed. So this is just like a screenshot of uh, the data entry screen using Android. So the main success, it was, uh, we're able to use that for, for nationwide rollout. So people were enrolled and data was collected into the system. So it was a success story. We are using that currently to generate the vaccination certificate in Togo. 
and it's actually compliant with the uh, Euro, um, uh, how do you call it? Euro standards. We also uh, were able to use that for informed decision. For example, when they had a lower rate of teachers being uh, vaccinated, the Ministry of Education was able to act upon it and encourage the teachers to get more vaccines. Uh, it also triggered the use of DHS for COVID surveillance. And you probably realize that we are the third country that was downloading the application most. But it's actually because we are now using it for COVID surveillance and we're also using it for community health uh, information system. So we are now, people are like, oh, you can use Android for a lot of data collection things. And you realize that it's actually increasing. The demand is increasing. Okay, so the, the, the last part is a nationwide success story. So our Minister of uh, Digital Economy has been praising their national system of vaccination, the electronic system, saying that we've been able to enroll people and people have their certificate is compliant and it's due to DHIS2. Uh, challenges, analytics. I mean, uh, we had issues with analytics in bringing up the data, but I mean, when we upgraded to 235, it was fine. Thanks to the developers and the feedback that uh, they got, we were able to have uh, the system to 235 and it was okay. We also had issues with uh, managing devices um, because some were uh, using their own devices and it was a bit, a, a bit difficult to manage, to upgrade, to support, and the versions were different. Those were the things that we had. We had also a, a problem in the beginning with the process because they actually wanted to enroll the population via an electronic system whereby the people that were above 50 were not that used to uh, internet to, and website. So when you come to the, when they come to the health, uh, health center, they were like, we want to get vaccinated. They said, you need to get enrolled in the system. Said, what system? So we needed to actually educate them and say, and make sure that they get enrolled into the system. So that was one of the challenges. Lesson learned. Well, it was possible to actually roll out a system in a fast period with the local support. So the fact that we were around and the Ministry of Health was already used to DHIS2, we could actually quickly support a system like that. Uh, the good thing also is that we had this feedback mechanism. So we are able to talk with the Android developers, with the web developers on the feedback that we got on the field and it was implemented immediately. And I mean, that actually was quite crucial for the rollout because we didn't have a lot of, of problems. Uh, so thank you very much. Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jerry. It's a problem when you have the long hair to take this. Um, anyway, um, so then our next presenter is, uh, um, sorry, I forgot your name. <laughs> Tiwanga, sorry, Tiwanga from Malawi. Thank you. Uh, thank you. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> okay, so the use case I'm, I'm presenting is on the community health uh, information system for Malawi. So uh, what you see on the Screen to the to the right is just a list of the the modules that we have within the uh, community health information system at, at the moment. So from uh, the the test server. So as as we go, I'll give you uh, the the rest of the the details. Oh, something with the connection. Yes, so the connection is off.
All right, so the connection is, is back again. So I think largely that's also why we use the Android app for offline work at, at, the, at the community level. All right, so uh, what we have as the integrated community health information system uh, for Malawi is an approach to having an integrated solution that supports all the work at community level. So over the years, there have been varied implementations to support the frontline workers. So now the ministry as part of uh, its community strategic plan wants to have a unified system where you'd have the community health worker using a single device to support all the uh, services that they, they provide. So this is where the uh, community health information system uh, comes into place. So the uh, system is owned by the, the Ministry of Health. It's coordinated through the digital health division with the support of the uh, community health services section, so which is responsible for the services at, at community level. So like what I showed you from that uh, initial slide, we have various uh, modules implemented at the moment, not all as because we still developing the, the components. So we're developing and then uh, rolling out. But at the moment where we have uh, deployed, we have uh, a community health register which observes uh, or gets data on community or village demographics as well as uh, community health. So schools, uh, sputum collection points and so on and so forth. And then there's a household register which is used for tracking environmental health at household level. Then the person register for person registration and linkage to various health programs. And then we have the integrated community case management, which is uh, an embedded protocol to guide the community health workers in managing childhood illnesses. So there's an embedded protocol that guides them through assessment. And then the app does tell them what the assessment classification is and what the management for the various detected conditions uh, should be. And then we've also implemented all the tools for the aggregate uh, reporting. So at, at the moment, in terms of the scope, we've uh, deployed in five districts, the fifth one being handled as we speak. So with over 750 mobile devices and the primary users, uh, community workers. So these are salaried government workers who are called uh, health surveillance assistants. So in terms of the uh, deployment approach, we've mainly tried to advocate, uh, advocate for similar devices so that we are able to manage things uh, better. And in prepping for, for the deployments, usually we have uh, various teams coming together to, to do the uh, installations as well as register the devices. And then there are also agreement forms that are given to the community health workers regarding how they should manage these devices. So for app uh, deployment, we're using F-Droid. So for the, for the versioning and uh, pushing to the, to the users. In terms of uh, upgrading to various uh, versions, we largely looking at staying a version behind just so that we see that you know, things are, are stable. And then in terms of uh, troubleshooting, because in the field, there are a few things that we need uh, attending to. So one, for example, where people have issues like with syncing, we check the, the sync logs. So in some cases we do ask them to send us the, the, the sync logs. So then also we do utilize uh, system logs. And then we have uh, configuration testing sessions mainly to check and validate uh, program rules because uh, since this is meant to guide service delivery, we have extensive uh, program rules implemented. Uh, for the main successes is that over time we've put together different teams to have uh, training of trainer sessions. And then also we've had uh, combined training because the ministry is also at the same time deploying paper-based uh, community registers and you know to make people comfortable we at the moment also facilitating the, the trainings for those paper registers together with the the app and then 
we've also over time introduced like pre and post assessments for the trainings just to also have some quality checks in terms of the, the work that we do. And post deployment, we do have routine um, visits to the districts to evaluate how things are progressing. And then we've had an integrated approach in terms of uh, system development and uh, the trainings rollout as well as the, the, the supervisions. You see that in the, in the final slide. Um, in terms of the, the main challenges, I think at times, uh, the challenges with uh, data syncing, uh, program rules testing can be a nightmare at times where you have extensive rules and also you have different people working on rules. So one fixes, the other one does another rule and it just you know, messes things up. And uh, one also interesting thing that has come at community level is the need for supporting a dual tract entity support because you know, the tracker model mainly looks at a tract entity, but here we have, let's say a household. So you want to track the household, but then you also want to track people inside the, the household. So that's a, a bit tricky at the, at the moment, but we've used relationships, but at the moment, the implementation, you know, the relationship linkage is soft. So you link, you tap on that X, uh, that, that's, that's gone. And then, uh, one other, I think, a slight challenge that we've had is in terms of uh, stages that are supposed to be linked. So in some cases where you'd want the stage to be locked, some program rules uh, still, still run. And then also linking related stages, like events across related stages, uh, in some cases has uh, proved uh, quite challenging. So for the lessons learned, we've seen that it's also important that we invest in digital literacy because when you go lower, more especially for older staff, uh, digital skills can be quite a challenge. And also with the rapid expansion of the implementation, we feel it's important that we also expand the various uh, competencies that we require. And then we, we've been able to coordinate multiple uh, implementations using different partners and deploying in multiple places at once. And then one key thing as well is the balance between work plan flexibility and uh, QA, like quality assurance, because we, we have a plan, but funding availability also has other plans. So you have to, to be able to, to balance those two, follow the, the funding, but also maintain the right level of uh, quality. And I think one other thing uh, finally is We've also felt, I think, the need that we need to communicate with the global Android team more than we actually do, given our implementations, because I think in the cases where we've done that, the response has been uh, quite good. So we'll improve on that. And uh, so in terms of the, the partnerships, these are the, the different uh, entities that have uh, taken part in, in, in doing this. So the ministry coordinating, the university, and also last mile health, uh, coordinating the, the technical assistance, UNICEF and uh, Wandikwe is uh, providing also uh, part of the, the funding with UNICEF uh, funding the, the most for, for this implementation. Uh, thank you very much. Our next guest is Patrick from Hispuganda. Okay, uh, good afternoon for those who are in here. So Patrick uh, Omiel is my name and um, I I'm here to share the, uh, the experience of uh, Uganda uh, implementing Android for the different uh, projects that we
much better. <laughs> oh. Okay, so as, um, as that gets on, so I'm here on behalf of a team uh, from uh, HISP Uganda, and of course the Minister of Health, uh, that uh, we've been working with to, to implement Android. Uh, so ours won't be one uh, use case, but basically it's a sum up of uh, what we've done and generally the entire experience of implementing Android. Um, of course, from uh, the team, uh, uh, we have uh, Immaculate, uh, a colleague who's, who was not able to join us for the conference, who kind of leads uh, country implementation in Uganda, and she has been very, very key uh, in making sure this works for us. And she has been coordinating well with the team. Uh, of course, Prosper is here, he's also part of the, <laughs> the team that uh, <laughs> we've been working with to implement. So mine is just to present. So if the hard questions come, uh, I'll deflect to Prosper and probably if Emma is online. It's supposed to be offline, but. <laughs> Okay, so our, we have, I would say maybe much longer history in terms of uh, uh, our implementation. It starts way back in, uh, could be 10 years ago, way back in 2012 is when we had the first Android implementation. And uh, this was for an NC project that was interested in uh, uh, tracking uh, of course, NC mothers across districts. That was the first, and that used version 2.16. I'm sure some of you are not even using DHIS2. So, so that was the first Android implementation we had in, in, in 2012. And then in 2013, we had another one that was uh, for global health security that was helping with the disease surveillance. Uh, and after that, the interest grew. We realized that, uh, yeah, you can use Android uh, to, um, to, 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 to capture data and the interest of course was uh, how do you use this with this offline capability. So, uh, and that was actually also the key requirement. And I think that is the sole purpose of Android. So currently, as we speak, we, we are using Android for the EIDSR. We're using it for TV surveillance. We're using Android for the COVID vaccination. And then we're using Android for uh, the point of entry uh, tracking. So those are some of the major uh, use cases we have. And uh, like you can see Emma, Emma is the colleague I was talking about. She really does the support uh, for our Android uh, implementation. So, uh, so this is just a summary of uh, what we've done with Android. Like I mentioned, we had a first implementation of the M uh, MCH project in four clinics and we used four tablets and same as uh, the, the, the one of IDSR for, uh, through the, uh, the global health security also for uh, tablets and we are also acknowledging the partners because getting these devices together, uh, you need support. And most times we don't have those resources. So most of uh, where we get is that when we get support, sometimes it comes with the, with the devices. Sometimes you have to look for other partners to provide the device. And uh, we've, uh, for again, EIDSR, uh, looking at mainly the COVID, we have uh, 160 tablets deployed at district level and also that, that supports both point of entry and also the, uh, the CTUs, the COVID treatment units. Uh, we also, of course, the TB surveillance, we've uh, rolled out TB surveillance uh, in Uganda. And uh, we all facilities that are not fine, we are doing a kind of hybrid uh, deployment in there. Uh, facilities that don't have computers, we've been able to provide them with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the tablets to be able to capture data. And then the health facility, uh, 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 that's quality assessment, uh, basically an assessment for health facility. They have also, we've also deployed Android for that. So basically it helps them to assess district teams and national teams to do assessment and facility. Uh, so we did the tracker configuration and also uh, deployed Android to support that. And of course the big one, the COVID vaccination, yeah where we had a lot of support from WHO and CDC to deploy Android. Yeah, so in terms of uh, our approach, and this is missing in this slide, it's, I think it's the same. We usually do the configuration, make sure tracker is up and running uh, on the web and just make sure every program rule and everything is working well. 
And then we, once we get the devices, we put them up in office and start doing the configuration. Yeah, making sure you've put the app, you've done all the configurations, you've put the username so that by the time you hand over to the, the end user, it's kind of set and ready uh, for, uh, uh, for, for them to use. So that again, they don't struggle a lot with uh, uh, being able to set it up. So we do the setup ourselves before we, we deploy uh, the, the, the devices to the field. And most of, for most of these, we've been able to try and uh, avoid the, the private own. Apart from this uh, TB, for most of the others, we do the, uh, the configurations and everything, then we hand over for them to, to be able to use. So in terms of benefits, some of these benefits are known. Uh, of course, the off offline capability is really a big benefit uh, to the users that they're able to, we're able to deploy in remote areas and be able to get data. Uh, we've been able to also utilize the, the part of the picture uh, for some cases, like if you're doing a health, health facility assessment, sometimes you need to capture some uh, proof uh, to show that, you know, you've been able to, if you'd say you're assessing and doing a scoring, there has to be some evidence that uh, uh, what you've scored is, is correct. So, or is what uh, you're able to observe. So that was also been a, a very good feature that uh, uh, we're using. The barcode scanner uh, has been uh, good with the lab integration. Uh, the QR scanner has allowed for applications such as the self-registration at points of entry. We've been able to use that for points of entry. Uh, and then you, using the guide, you know, this is something that I personally went through a very bad experience of not following the guide and basically getting Android with my super user account uh, and then <laughs> setting up Android and going to demonstrate. And then when I reach there, I touch, things freeze. I touch, things freeze. So really the experience we learned here is trying really to stick to the guidelines. Yeah, making sure you create the right user account that works for Android. It's very, very important uh, to follow the guidelines. And then we learned, of course, less is better. This is mobile for, 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 for a tablet, for you don't have to have so much. Yeah, and, and, and that goes back to the idea of uh, using it for vaccination and peer, there's a line of people and you are there with a tablet, it can be slow. So sometimes when you have less, the better. You, it will work fast and, and you'll be able to quickly capture, you know? Yeah, so less is better. So as you do the design, try and make it uh, tight and uh, something that fits mobile, you know? And then uh, the, the assessment is a good use case. So we've learned, you know, people feel good when they're going to do an assessment and they're holding a tablet and asking questions and just, you know? So it has been one of the interesting use cases for, for us. Uh, the last slide. So in terms of challenges, of course, the software issues are there. <laughs> uh, the, on the update, uh, uh, when newer versions come, yeah, we've had some, uh, some challenges coming. One more minute, okay. <laughs> when you get your versions, you run into issues. This is known, yeah? And then there are times when you fail to sync and you cannot even uh, like redeem. So you kind of lose that data and just uh, flush it out and, and re-enter. Uh, and clear logging, I think this one has been mentioned, uh, inconsistencies between the web and, uh, and Android. I guess this was also mentioned by other colleagues. Uh, we also have other competing uh, flashy web uh, Android apps that people use. Like COVID, we are really, you know, in the field struggling, you know. Uh, other people wanted to use Comcare and other uh, tools to, to do uh, uh, so. But still, once we, we have deployed, it's usually hard to be uh, pushed out. And then the last... Uh, the operational part is really you have limited budget for these devices. So you have to plan for it, you know. Uh, the event management, when you give these devices out, sometimes you may not recover it. Especially when you're working people in the district and very remote areas. It may become someone's mobile phone or mobile device. So it becomes very difficult. Uh, remote maintenance uh, and support, and that comes with the cost of the MDM. We are not able to uh, run this for now. Yeah, so that was a Uganda experience and uh, uh, over to the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. And our last guest is um, Sheila from South Digitus. Um, good afternoon. Oops, thanks. 
Uh, good afternoon all. My name is Sheila. I'm leading the implementation team in Mozambique and I will be um, telling you guys some stories about the implementation of Android in Mozambique. I think as Patrick, we are not going to focus on one uh, specific uh, implementation use case. Uh, we will be talking uh, like broadly um, about this uh, implementation process in Mozambique. Um, as a quick uh, introduction, um, we start using DHS2 in Mozambique since 2015. And uh, in 2017, our country um, started to adopting the, the approach of using the Android version for this national control for TB program. Um, and after that, the malarian program also start using with uh, IMISH, which is uh, integrated malaria system uh, storage. And the, the surveillance program also start using um, the Android uh, version. Currently, the, 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 the Ministry of Health has several um, tracker implementations, which were, which why we are in the second place of using this device um, uh, as a way of implementing the, the DHIS. Um, for instance, in terms of DHIS, Android, uh, the Ministry, and uh, we have been using most over the over 18 8,000 um, devices for the IMISH program, 2,000 for the TB program, and also 15 for the, 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 the COVID. Uh, we have supporting other countries um, using the same uh, approach, such as Guinea-Bissau, São Tomé and Principe, um, using the, the, the device as a mechanism to, to, to implement our, our, our programs. Um, as a deployment approach, uh, we use it, um, the testing and Android version was performed by SD, us, uh, to cope of a DHS version similar to the, to the production version. We, we use the, the web version and then we tested to see how it works on the, on the, on the, on Android uh, version. We have worked also on installing these devices on, on all devices. And then um, in some countries, uh, we had used the F-Droid as a mechanism of uploading the, the DHS uh, because we're more easier for us to have this control of the, of the version um, for, for some implementation. Uh, lately, we start using the, the Mirador um, because of the advantages of using Mirador, such as a remote control, because we have been working with uh, several countries and it's sometimes it's very e easy to have these um, to have these management devices control um, for this uh, remote um, monitoring and upgrading version. We have also uh, worked with the capacity building um, of the users. And during this deployment approach, we, we did a lot of TOTs with, uh, local, uh, with, uh, with our local um, members from the health facilities to make sure that they will um, also train the, the, the other people. And then we had this uh, regular support and troubleshooting. Uh, we had created a lot of uh, WhatsApp groups which were more easier to, to have feedback from them during this, this um, interaction uh, during the implementation. And also we have been helping uh, on upgrade the devices in the, the DHIS app uh, versions. Um, has a main success um, using the, the, the Android version, it brought more flexibility in terms of data entry uh, because um, I think we all know that one of the, the, the main reasons we are using the, these devices is because of the ventures of using offline um, data entry process, because we have um, health facilities that don't have connectivity in certain areas. Uh, with this um, future, it, 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 um, it allows more of them to do the data entry. And then when they have, they have connectivity, they can, they can send. Also allowed the individual 
and aggregate data to be entering in this offline mode, uh, using the device to input data from different uh, programs. In terms of saving uh, resources, having these devices in each um, health facility helped the, the, the health facility person to entering this data from, from, from several programs. And also we use um, the, the mirror door um, has a way of ensuring this uh, remote and centralized device update, allowing tracking devices and also allowing being mobile um, data consuming. Because one of our biggest um, challenge is regarding to, to data consuming uh, and with this control, it was more easier to have, um, how can I say, um, how much a health facility could uh, consume regarding to, to data. And then we use as planning for, for other implementations. Um, as a challenge, um, our colleagues mentioned some challenge regarding to the up the program rules and everything I think uh, we have been discussing in other groups, but um, in terms of implementation on site, uh, the literacy of the health facilities in manipulating the, the devices was one of the, the bigger challenge. Um, for that, actually one of our approach when we are doing the capacity building is to make sure that one of the first um, things that we teach them it's how to use a mobile phone because um, it starts from, 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 from there. And also maintaining uh, the devices, it's very, um, it's have been a, a big challenge because we have high costs to use the, the MDNs and sometimes we have to use um, in the not paid um, version. And then we have this limitation on help the people remotely, and also sustainability with the, the device acquisition, because we know the devices have like a lifetime very, very short. And sometimes we have to uh, make sure that uh, we have a plan that it's sustainable for, for all these devices. Um, the uh, compatibility of Android devices or field devices with uh, DHS um, capture versions um, for example, for the TB program, that was the first one uh, using the, the mobile implementation. E, we, had, um, we had a version of Android, which was five, and these devices couldn't be upgraded for new versions of uh, Android. These ones that are, it's being displayed there. And uh, with the new features of the DHS app, Sometimes um, this incompatibility, it, make is, it makes um, us to not update the version of the Android in uh, like the version of the app in these Android phones. And they and this device start to be um, not helpful because for example, now we have new updates for the analytic part for the Android and they cannot use because the device uh, version doesn't allow them to have a new version of the DHS one. And also management of internet. Um, there is a lot of costs regarding to the internet management. And this has been uh, also one of our biggest uh, challenge uh, for, for, for the Mozambique experience. It was this, thank you. Hard with the long hair, I know. Um, okay, thank you, Sheila. Um, so we open this for questions. Okay, it's here. Okay. I have a question about the incompat incompatibility of versions. Because if it doesn't work on 5.0, then we need to know, because in theory it was working down to 4.4 until the last version. 
Okay, um, um, for the first versions of the, the capture, yeah, it's possible. This, what, this is the one that we are using. But for example, for 2.6, um, the minimal, it's not the, the, the- It's five. Yeah, but it's not, um, when we are using, it's kind of doing a, a crush. And that's why we have to use the, the lowest one so far. Okay, then it will be good to learn about that. Okay, yeah. Thank you. I'm going there first, then coming to Prosper, and I'm going to run the room. <laughs> uh, I have a question uh, regarding the usage of F-Droid. Uh, did the teams that used F-Droid for distributing the app set up their own repositories, or were you distributing it publicly? And could you please share your uh, experiences with using it? Um, sorry, can you repeat the last part? I didn't get it very well. So with F-Droid, um, did you set up your own repository for distributing the app or did you upload it to the public repository of F-Droid? Okay, um, for the F-Droid, we created our own um, repository and then we um, uploaded uh, the versions because we have like um, different link for each implementation because sometimes it used different versions of uh, DHS too. And then we upload the right version for each one. So uh, when we set up for the Androids, they have um, a direct link for this specification, for this specific Android version that they, the that they DHS update they have to use. I mean, yeah, so in short, we also set up our own repository that we use for distributing the apps. I, I don't think we can publish the app in the public F-Droid because it uses some Google services and libraries that uh, prevent us from that. We are trying to remove all dependencies and then it will be available in F-Droid without requiring uh, individual repositories. have Prosper, right? Yeah. So it's Prosper, then... Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you uh, very much, all the presenters. One of the challenges we are having is um, uh, using one device at one clinic for multiple programs which are running at mul with multiple instances. Um, so you have a TB program, which has its own instance. That's a different URL. URL. Uh, you have HIV program, you have an assessment program and so on. So most of the users have been coming to us and like, why do I have to have different devices? Because right now it is forcing me to have different devices. So to the Android developers, is there something that we are thinking about? Uh, and also to the implementers, do we have any, <laughs> any solution to that? I don't know. Maybe this is one. Yeah. And, oh, and sorry. The other implementers, if they have had any. You were not in my session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we support multi user offline now. My from 2.6 up to three accounts. Okay, good. That's good. Different instances. Yes. Different instances or different servers. It's a combination of the URL and the user. Okay. okay. Good. I think we have time for maybe <laughs> one last question. Uh, no, I think it was, yeah. Okay, the last two questions. <laughs> <laughs> we get yeah. And you next. There we go. Thanks. I'm not a DHS2 expert at all, but we're coordinating this. this uh, project on surveillance. And so I had a similar question to Prosper. So I saw that in Uganda, you're different using each program has like a different device. And Mozambique, it seems like it's, you know, the same device for several programs. And how can we, you know, make sure that, you know, we can use one device for the different programs. And then another question is, can you use like the Android for like case-based surveillance where you have like, you know, so many variables and, and entering that at health facility level? Is, do you think that's something that's recommended or do you, or do you recommend more like having like paper-based for case-based data with, you know, hundred 
different variables. Who's taking that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, yes, yeah, so I think on the, as I said, in terms of, I think the, the, the multiple accounts, those can be supported, but also in, in some cases, I think where things can be combined, it's, it's best to, to do that because you also get to run away from one health worker having multiple devices for, for each program. Like what we've done is to also assess the districts who already has devices for, from other programs and see whether those are fit to deploy on. And then we, we use those and then give to those that don't have. Uh, in terms of surveillance, I think, yeah, there are different ways of organizing the data. So you, you, you can be able to, to support that, like on, 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 the, on the Android. Yeah, so, and you can also use, I think, multiple stages if you have too many rules, if you want to do computations, but you should be able to handle that. Yes, okay. Um, so for any, for any of the presenters, I'm, I was curious, for those of you that specified the hardware as opposed to the bring your own, um, can you talk about the specific vendors that you used, um, any specific models that you, you uh, specified? And, and yeah. yeah. Okay, um, we are, most of uh, the device that we are using are like Samsung. And uh, now we have been working also with Lenovo. There is a um, different uh, advantage of these two devices. For example, for the Lenovo ones, um, they are more used for the work because there is this, um, for example, we do not allow you to use a phone. There is no mobile, no phone calls. So it reduces the, the, the use for non-use work activities. And for the Samsung one, we use um, with some specifications, but uh, there is this MDNs that allow us to create a restriction. Um, thanks for the phone. It also reduced the, the, the use of non-use uh, um, beside work activities. Uh, just on the on the device, I think the, the one that we're preferring is the Galaxy uh, S7 Lite. At the moment, it fits what we want to do quite well. Oops, sorry. Oh, thank, thank you so much. I, I wanted to find out from Malawi the issue of uh, security of devices against um, loss or theft. How are you managing that? And also just from Togo, a quick one, how many devices are you using? Um, and what is your internet penetration um, percentage within your country? Yeah. Okay, so I think for, for us in terms of the management of the, the devices, Elon, as I said, uh, there is, an agreement form. So these are government devices. So I think as part of giving the devices to the frontline workers, because these are also government employees, these yeah, it, sort of like an agreement form that they would have to sign in terms of the responsibilities for keeping the device and also the way of escalation uh, if they were to lose a device. And then there's the structured district level and then Admin, at central ministry level to follow through should there be a loss or any other thing that needs attending to. Okay. Jerry, internet penetration. <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> well, I don't have the correct figures for, for the number of devices that we have, but all the health facilities are currently having devices for, uh, how do you call it? The ones that the facilities that are supposed to enter data for vaccination have their devices. So I don't have the correct figure. So I don't want to say a wrong figure. For internet penetration, I mean, you have internet, of course, in the capital city and around the capital city. In the northern part, it's a bit remote. The internet penetration is not that, I mean, you don't have internet all the time. But of course, there is this offline capability. So people have been using that for, for synchronization. Of late, we didn't, have, we didn't have any complaints from the, uh, um, from the sites related to internet. They've been able to send the data 
and people have been able to get their certificates because we use that to get the, the certificates. Okay, over. Thank you. And I forget to use Android.